Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for spending some of your precious time with us here for the next 45 minutes. Um, I seriously hope that you've topped up on caffeine or your poison of choice, because it's going to be a, a bit of a roller coaster of a ride. You're not going to have time to, to stop and think, I don't think. So first of all, let me introduce the speaker. So Carl Elrod is a TEDx speaker of considerable repute, um, has uh, advised several th thousands of companies in online behaviors, changing technologies, and how they impact business. Um, but this is backed up by over 25 years of experience within e-commerce. But uh, we have got 120 slides over the next 45 minutes. We are going to have a microphone at each end. And at an appropriate point, some of you are going to be asked to provide topics of your choice. So start thinking about something that you might like to ask Carl and what sort of topic you might want to put in front of him. But without further ado, Carl, if you'd like to join us on stage, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. Nice to see a full room. OK, so as most speakers in, in this world that actually do this professionally, I will not tell you to put down your phone. Because what I want you to do is to play around with it and record and take photos and live stream or whatever you like. I encourage you to try to use this as your memory in your pocket. Because we're going to go fast. As we just talked about, it's going to be a lot of slides. So let's just jump in there. We're going to talk about the future. And the future, for me, is maybe not exactly the same as the future for you guys, because I work in the future. But to be able to do that, we need to look back a bit. So let's take a look at what we just overcome in the last year and uh, what the audience and I talked about last year. But if we just jump in there, it's one year. One year of amazing achievements around the world. So let's not spend too much time on this. Just a couple of seconds. AI, we all know about it. But last year, we did not really talk about it. We didn't address it as this amazing opportunity because it was a little bit too far away from what we could really grasp at that time. Meta was a hot topic. And then Mark Zuckerberg started to tweak and see that, OK, so the VR world is not really happening in the way that he envisioned and so on. So he started to slow down this amazing area of virtual reality, which I still think is quite interesting, but maybe not in the same way as Mark Zuckerberg uh, thinks. and. Uh, uh, build the platform around. So while Mark Zuckerberg started to slow down, there was another company that thought, let's take another approach on this. And Apple started to actually offer a very new view on it from their point of view, because they've not been in this space before. They created an XR headset, which is both VR and our augmented reality, AR. So we're creating a mixed reality environment which, again, gives energy back to the virtual space, but the virtual space maybe not being this room that doesn't connect with the reality. And this is super interesting, because this is what we're going to dig more into. But with that in mind, we have other areas that have also happened over this year. We have the Tesla robot that a year ago was just this amazing, beautiful picture and a guy on stage wearing some sort of suit, no robot at all. And just, I think it's three days ago, we saw the real robot that is actually doing, doing yoga. And the movements are so smooth and amazingly well maneuvered. We also seen Neuralink that in the beginning of um, last year was just still on on very experimental grounds, but they had already made some amazing achievements. And two days ago, they actually were approved to start installing or experimenting with humans and installing the Neuralink implant into brains of people. And um, Elon Musk said that he's up for it, so let's see when he's up for it. The idea with Neuralink is to 
ex uh, to focus on giving powers to people that have not as many opportunities as maybe you and I have, that ha have some sort of limitations to begin with. But as we know, the world is moving fast. So let's see where this goes. We have NVIDIA that have been around for quite some time. But NVIDIA managed to do something that is quite extraordinary. They created, in, uh, created an artificial intelligence chip that all countries around the world are just trying to get their hands on. And I just came from Saudi Arabia, where they bought 4,000 ships at a price of around 40,000 pounds per ship. So there is a considerable investment going on, but there is also a shortage of this. But as I said, everything's moving fast. So let's jump straight into where we actually want to go and where we are right now. We have these huge companies that stand on these high pillars and actually look down on us in one way or another. And we look up at them and think that, OK, so they're in this safe space, a safe space where they have been building something for quite some time. And they have a, a very good position on the market. But now with this change with AI, that's not really the case. Because what you see is these people that are all the way up there. But what they see is a threatening position. Because they are so grounded. They are so fixed into the current setup that utilizing these innovative solutions might come at a cost that they can't really handle in terms of twisting the way that they are working. To actually be able to utilize this new technology and, and big companies start to think big from the beginning. So how can we actually build our very own large language model, model or LLM? And maybe that's not where we should start. Maybe it's not about building your own AI solution. Because if you're doing that, you're sort of going to watch paint dry. And that's going to take some time, time that you don't have. And these companies have this problem. They created a fence around them that basically protect them from threats. But right now, they're fenced in. They are in a position where they're challenged by all these smart companies that are much smaller, faster moving organizations, like this. They come and they surprise companies that have this huge position already. We're talking about companies like Eleven Labs that, from just an idea, created a, a way to duplicate one person's voice. And this is a small startup that is now making a tremendous move on the market. We just saw Spotify releasing a solution where they offer each and every podcast to be automatically translated to other languages using the voice used in the podcast. So you can listen to your favorite podcast in Hindu or in Chinese or whatever you like, but it's been recorded in English or in Swedish or in Spanish. All of a sudden, what we have been talking about that we have access to the knowledge of the world might actually come true. Because we won't have the language barriers that we have been held back by for quite some time. So let's pin this and just remember this for a second. And let's jump into what expectations are there. What do our consumers, the people that we actually produce our solutions for, look for. And when we say look for, have you actually put yourself in their shoes? Really put yourself in their shoes, tried your service out, tried your competitor services out, to feel that emotion that your consumers, your buyers, your customers experience on a daily basis. I know this is, this is like the first thing that every company should do. You have it in your playbooks, I'm sure. But whenever I work with a company, this is not the case. They put on a pair of glasses and 
pretend to be the customer. They don't actually act and feel like the customer. So you don't get those pain points that the consumers actually experience. So try to really emphasize this in the near future. Because what I see is that the, the space of e-commerce has been evolving. It's been amazing evolvement because we have more and more customers coming. And with the pandemic, the positive side for the e-commerce space what, was that, OK, consumers are inside. They are limited in, uh, in terms of what they can reach. And the e-commerce space had an, an amazing opportunity to actually supply consumers with whatever they looked for. But to me, as a consumer, this bowl is still just a bowl. And it's being marketed, it's being presented online in just the same way. Just the same way for me and for all of you. Whenever you go online and try to buy this, you will see a product description. You will see the same pricing. You will see the same button. You will see the same customer journey. But I'm not one equals a person that have, like, I'm not the same as all of you. And you're not the same as me and everyone around you. So today, why would I accept a customer experience that is not tailored for me? Because we have all the capabilities. We just talked about something that we have been using as, as something to log into systems, something that is quite secure. We talked about voice, thinking that this is a protected secret. Nobody can in interpret my voice in the exact pattern as, as I'm using it. So if we can do that, of course we can create a customer journey that is tailored to the different data points that we collect throughout whatever interaction we have with our customers. And there is a bunch of different methods that we can do that with. But let's pause that for a second and just move on. Because what we're talking about is that this lovely box is what we are still holding ourselves inside. In the box, we have several small cubes, different systems, different solutions, different tailored offers, or whatever we like to call it. But it's still just a cube. And what I'm talking about is something that is so much more amazing, that from the outside, you can see that it's a box, but it's, it's something more, something magical. And I just visited a real place that was a box, a mirror box, in the desert in Saudi Arabia that looked like it was invisible. This building is a huge building. And when you come, and come up to it, as it mirrors all the surrounding, and even me, it's hard to actually see the house. And this is what I'm talking about. Touching on these emotions to make something magical. And again, let's pin this and move on. We talked about one year. Think about this. What do you guys think will happen in the next year? Because we've seen this advancement in just one year. And that is just the starting ground for this paradigm shift, or whatever we like to call it. Of course, we will see that the market grow. But in reality, it's more going to be like this. It's going to be a bit of failure. It's going to be some opportunities. And some will struggle, and some will not. It's how it's always been. What I need you guys to do is to actually pick up your toolbox and use those tools that are available. Not the same old tool that you've been using forever and ever, but actually try some new ones. And obviously, AI is, is a space of immense opportunities. So with the AI space, we're actually talking about analyzing how a thought pattern is created. 
we're talking about that artificial intelligence as, as we know of it today, we can't really understand the conclusions. We see the conclusions. They are amazing already. But the language model and the learning, the, the brain behind it, is a closed book for us. This is an interesting part, and this is what many people are worried about. So if I give you an, a quick example, if we train a language model on a language like English, and then say, your goal is to translate this to this other language, let's say Spanish, what happens is that the AI will start to analyze the English text and create its understanding of this content. And when, when you guys think about understanding, you think, OK, so this sentence says this, and so on and so on. What the AI model is doing is actually rewriting this text in its own way to explain each and every sentence in detail. So this sentence illustrates this. The emotion in the sentence is this. And on we go. And it creates a data bank of what it is that we're trying to communicate with this document, and not just what we're saying. So instead of translating to Spanish, it's translating into its own knowledge a black box that we can't read. It's its own knowledge, it's its uh, own code, so we can't access it, we can't understand it. And then it translates to Spanish like it was a Spanish, um, uh, like it's been um, born in Spain and speaking Spanish for its entire life. This is interesting because what we have seen this develop into is that the, the brain if we may call it, can be used for all these other things as well. So when we train it on a language, we actually see that the, the understanding can be used to modify video, to create beautiful songs, and more and more. So we're not going to talk so much about truth, but more about trust. Because to me, the truth as we know it is being challenged. We thought we knew what computers were doing. We thought we knew ones and zeros. We thought we knew how to analyze and create and structure a thought. But as we see, we don't. So for us to be able to handle this, we can't just stay in our, our shares and, and trust that the future is going to be great. We need to jump up and do things. But this is how everyone feels to some extent when we start looking at this. The companies that I work with, they are confused but also worried. And they're trying their best to find a way to protect themselves, protect their current situation, meaning that they're actually not making a move. And what I talk about is doing this. It's not to do one move. It's to do a bunch of different things. And in the e-commerce space, we've been talking about this over and over and over again. Experiment, 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 and see what works. So A-B testing is going to be here for a long, long time onwards. But maybe A-B testing can be empowered with AI. Maybe we can A-B test a solution using AI features to actually remove some of the alternatives and create some new alternatives that you have not even thought about. Because what you're looking for is, is a golden egg. You're looking to create something that is an amazing fit for the market right here, right now. What I'm looking for is for you guys to create just a pile of eggs. And then eventually, some of those eggs Will, come, will become shiny. And as you polish and polish, they will be more and more beautiful or attractive to whoever your customer is. 
but do it together with your customers. Don't do it in a lab on your own. So again, let's pin this as well and jump over to e-commerce as the standard way of thinking of it. But why are we talking e-commerce still? It's 2023. What we thought we would be talking about is more like a virtual space of how you consume goods, right? And when I talk about this, I'm questioning this. And I've been questioning this for quite many years. Because when we talk about books, we talk about books even if it's an audiobook, a paperback, a hardcover, or if it's an ebook, it's still a book. But in the e-commerce space, we're separating these things. We say e-commerce, we say retail, and we say um, mail order and so on. Mail order doesn't really exist any longer, but it does. <laughs> um, so going back to the consumer again, we'll pin this and get back to that in a minute. Because what we see in front of us is this highway of opportunities. And it's just an open space full of opportunities that we can make amazing things out of. But in reality, that's not really the case. Incorporating AI into your company and into whatever tech stack or whatever solution you're offering is going to be a bumpy ride. You have to go back and forth. You have to dare to hit the walls. Otherwise, you will be left behind. Your competitors will be the winners because they dare to do it. Or perhaps there is this young company that comes from nowhere and just experiments like crazy. And all of a sudden, they figure out how to solve the problem that you have not even touched on. So polish those eggs. And in the AI space, let's identify the marbles that we want to play with. And the only way is to actually start playing with them. Because AI is not a thing. We haven't defined AI as a thing yet. We don't have an AI product that everybody goes to. We don't have the regulations yet. And the concern here is obviously the regulatory part, both from a regulatory point of view, but also from your point of view that right now there is an opportunity that is not limited. Eventually, will box it into some sort of form and shape, and then you will not see the same opportunities as you can see today. Because AI space is moving in all directions, literally all directions. Like here, for example, if you have not seen this, it's quite interesting study on how to analyze the brain. So they show a bunch of pictures to, to people and then analyze the brain pattern and try to see with the analytical model what it is that the individual is looking at. And this is the result. It's not perfect, but we definitely see that there's similarities. The teddy bear looks like a teddy bear. So in a way, the AI can already read our mind if we let it to. Moving on, I actually started in the e-commerce space back in early 2000. I was offering a, a service where we worked with young designers to present their products to the global market. Interior design and um, everything within that space. I loved it. It was so much fun. And we really tried to push all the boundaries. But we were way too early. And then there's been some challenges throughout the market. But what I learned is that, again, the ball looks just the same. It's basically the consumers that have changed, that have started to understand that, OK, there is an opportunity here for us. And the more the consumers demand, the more we actually need to understand how to run faster. Because the AI, oh, the e-commerce space has not even entered its teenage state. 
we don't see any revolutions in terms of how you work with your consumers. Just like a teenager are trying to, to create its own space. Because we still have a shopping cart. We are still following the standards of retail in the e-commerce space. So this year, the standards just changed. Because right now, you can actually mix those standards with a more creative way of working. The AI opportunities have created creativity, something that we thought was only something that we humans mastered. But consumers, they really expect something special. They, they want to feel that you care about them. They want to feel special. So let's pin this again and get back to that real soon. And as you see, we have been collecting a bunch of different pins throughout this presentation. And what I want us to do is start connecting these pins in your mind, because what we're creating is a pattern, a pattern that maybe you have not created before, or maybe you have already visited this in your own safe space. And the more you do this as an exercise, the more you will actually start to create something that more and more looks like synapses in your brain that evolves into new opportunities, new thoughts, new ways of offering a service and uh, actually challenging the market. Because we've been talking about the dopamine effects in social media for quite some time. The dopamine effect that actually makes us feel happiness and something more, something that basically is connected to fear of missing out, which we talk a lot about in, so in uh, Silicon Valley. Fear of missing out, and we just keep on swiping in social media. But if we can create a similar feeling, emotion, that is not almost like a drug, but a, a positive emotion, and not just polishing that, that ball that we see in and offering it as a ball in blue, white, 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 and orange. Let's create something that is actually different. Let's do predictions. Because if we predict things, we're not looking at what our competitors are doing. And while we're not looking at our competitors, competitors we are starting to be creative. Because this is what we're looking for. This is what we want our customers to look like when they have made their transaction. Of course, this is obvious. But this is not the case. So together, how about painting a canvas? How about really playing around with this as we go now? Because this is what I want your mind to look like after this, and how your office should look the next couple of weeks. This is what I want you to start working on, and not just keeping to your current way of working. Be creative and play around. Be kids again, in a way. And I keep on saying this over and over again in wherever I go. Understand who your customers are. And in this case, the audience, you are running an e-commerce site or an e-commerce solution in one way or another, or you're just solution providers that incorporate with existing e-commerce platforms or sites, or maybe you're a student. So depending on who you are, you will most probably pick up different things from what I'm talking about here. But as I said, let's play around. Let's have a fist bump situation. And I will first just tell you about the concept of this. And this is me experimenting. I have never done this before on stage. So let's see how it goes. But um, I have a daughter. She's 13 now. But uh, when she was younger, 
instead of reading a, a book for her when she wanted to go to bed, I told her that it's up to you to define the story, the, the outer parts. So give me a name, give me a situation, and give me something more. And then I will make a story for you. One unique story every evening as you go to bed. And this was our exercise of experimenting. It became a beautiful thing that she's using in her own way today. So let's see if we have some microphones in the audience. We have one here. OK, so give it to someone over there. <laughs> and then some, anyone reach, uh, reach out for the microphone, and you will just give a topic. Nobody dares to reach the microphone. Yeah, amazing. Auto fully automated uh, content creation. Fully automated content creation. Using AI. Of course, we'll get there. And uh, fully automated content creation. And then we need something from over there as well, just to add to this story that we're going to make up as an experiment. Where are we in the world? Or who is our customer? Who is, who's, who's the customer base? Carl, let's go for, let's go for privacy. What is privacy? It? Yeah. OK. So AI content generation and privacy. Can we add something more? Any hands? Automation in grocery segment. Privacy automation in growth. Uh, in grocery segment. Grocery services. OK, interesting. So if we, if we just play around with this idea, and as I said, this is an experiment. What can we do within this space, given the current AI environment and so on? So, Privacy, let's, let's touch on that a little bit. Let's give the customer the possibility to share their current view. So we're activating the camera with their approval. And with that, we, we have seen this a bunch of times. We talked about it, but we actually don't use it. So let's use the camera. We scan the, the fridge. And with that, we automa automatically analyze the content in the fridge. We connect that to an online database of recipes. And then the closest grocery store that can deliver whatever you're missing within 45 seconds or whatever, just to make stuff up. Like, this is what I'm looking for that we can create. And what I suggest that you guys do when you get back to your offices is to play around in the same way just throw out a bunch of different personas, throw out different situations, and throw out some sort of limitation to simplify this. And what you'll see is that we all of a sudden create new customer journeys. And with that, you challenge your competitors. So what I want us to do is to not just listen to the speakers, but to listen to each other. But the experiment, we don't have enough time to, to run further more experiments. But I'm happy to join in your experiments, if you like me to. And we can drive this together. Because whenever you experiment, there's a bunch of different ideas that pops up. But every now and then, we see some sort of focus area. And this is something that I've been doing for 20 years in mind mapping situations, where I just brainstorm ideas. And I do the same for the keynotes that I design. And eventually, those focus areas start to grow and grow and grow. And I find patterns. I find interesting things going on. And all of a sudden, I see that, OK, so this is something that we could touch on together. This is something that we could pressure test and experiment and A-B test with whoever the audience might be. So let's not just follow the path, but actually create these things and polish them into some sort of product offer. Because that's where you become uh, your competitive strength, where you add value 
on a market that is already offered all these different things, but in the same box. So create a new box. Experiment 89. And again, we'll pin this because we talked about one year. So I don't want to see you here in the audience next year saying that you didn't do anything with this. Because if that is the case, then you're going to be in a very, very bad situation. Because the rest of the audience, parts of it, will have made a change. An e-commerce space, maybe we'll see that the Apple Vision Pro takes off. And maybe Apple have embedded other solutions within their existing products that you have in your pocket already that we have not seen the features of because they are waiting for the right time and the right move. So maybe the e-commerce space will look totally different with a totally different AR layer on the reality. But what I think we'll see is an e-commerce experience that looks much more tailored to me, where the camera is going to be used in different ways. And in our computers and our phones, we have several different types of cameras. We can measure body size. We can measure lots of different things that we personally don't think of, so that you can actually simplify the purchase process and not just offer a standard e-commerce site, because you want to be the winner. You want to be that star. You want to own your market. But if we talk a little bit about technologies that have been used already in the AI space, LinkedIn, for example, they are experimenting with this as a concept. They have an AI that come up with article ideas. And then they invite people on the LinkedIn platform to write the articles given this topic. And a bunch of people goes in and, and write contributions, at the, as they call them. But it's not just a thumbs up contribution. It's a, it's a small article, which is kind of interesting. And LinkedIn, as well, is experimenting with that if you're looking for a new employee and you want to go out with a job ad, you can post that information, but it's going to be an AI that writes the job ad for you so that you get what you're looking for. But of course, you will still be there to approve that whatever the, the position explains is actually the reality and what you're looking for. Amazon, of course, are making a big move, but they are doing it, as we've been talking about, in small pieces. So for example, they are experimenting with pre-shipping they don't call it pre-shipping, but basically to simplify it, they are shipping products closer to you so that when you buy it, it's going to be delivered in record time. They can show that this product can be delivered to your house much faster than any competitor because they have predicted that you will buy it. That's a kind of interesting move. So they're moving their warehouse around all the time based on predicted patterns. They also realize that having 2,000 uh, recommendations and, and uh, reviews on a product doesn't add the value that the customers are looking for, because we don't read 2,000 reviews. So instead, they take all those reviews, they load them into an AI model that outputs, this is what people say is good, this is what people say is bad, and this is why people recommend you to buy it or not to buy it. It's a summary, but it's written like one complete summary of all those reviews. It's not made up stuff. It's connected to the actual reviews. So what I want to do here today is not to give you all the different AI tools out there, because they, there is basically too many. I just wanted to plant a seed, a thought maybe several thoughts that we interconnected with these pins. But it's up to you to actually start to put some water on this thought and create your own future. Because don't be that guy sitting on your chair just relaxing and 
not making that move. Be the person that dare to bump in the walls and find a path forward. That's all from me at this moment. And we have four minutes for Q&As. Please. Yeah, so the uh, topic I gave you about fully automated um, content creation with AI, can you give me some examples of how you've seen that work? Of course. So what we have seen, if you haven't played around with Midjourney yet, definitely you should try that out. But there are a bunch of different content uh, and image manipulation tools out there. There's all the, also video manipulation tools. So what I th I'm quite surprised that we have not seen this yet, but what I think we'll see in a matter of weeks is a full uh, customer journey that have, have been totally generated by an AI based on a content base, content uh, source information about the product. So let's say these shoes, if you want to sell them online, then just explain the details around the shoes, uh, add a bunch of photos of how the shoes look, like three and then let the models generate a video of the shoes, just rotating, the video of someone wearing the shoes walking with them, and add whatever other situations that can connect to an emotional touch. Where would those shoes be used? Where do you add the logic of these shoes adding more value than this other pair of shoes? To create a customer journey that is connected to something that we feel for. Because right now, it's a photo, maybe a video, text, and a buy button, and there is a price. I think we're long gone from that experience as consumers. We want to be greeted. Like when we go into a store and, and we feel that someone takes care of us, that is what we're looking for. I just got a quick follow up. So I, I used AI the other day to buy a, a cushion, and, and it was the you know, the first time I thought it was, you know, going to deliver me something that was excellent. And I told it to compare the reviews on Amazon, on Google, Trustpilot, and to compare all of the available uh, Google uh, top 10 lists. And what I was assuming would be like the absolute best. And it turned out it came and it, it wasn't suitable. So I was a little disappointed. So my question is, I suppose, how to use AI, ask it the right questions, and, and, and really have confidence that you're getting something back that you don't need to double, triple check. Yeah. So the, the challenge that we'll experience, and, and this is something that we'll see for quite some time, before we actually have our own trained AI. And when I say our own trained AI, I'm actually meaning our own data source of what it is that I'm looking for, who I personally am. Like, we're talking about digital twins a lot. Digital twin is basically someone that impersonates me from an AI space. I like these colors. I like th a cushion to be this soft. I like to use it when I sit in the sofa, but when I sleep, I don't want a cushion or whatever. Like, the more data we can add into as a background when I ask the question, the better our response will be. So, for example, when I work with tools like ChatGPT, I have a Google Docs document on the side that is about five A4 pages long that specify this is how I want you to behave. So you feed that in every time you start a conversation, you, you, you plug this yes. information in? Yeah, so I plug in a base content, and then depending on the situation, I have other base contents that I add on top of that. But there is always one base that say, always act and behave like this. Like, I never want you to make stuff up. If there's facts, make sure that there's actual facts. If there's numbers and statistics, double check that with a current online source so that you use actual data and not your training data, and so on and so on. Can I just? Can I just add to that, Carl? One of the questions I'd written down, just in case you didn't have any, was it struck me that actually what we, what we really need to make sure is that, and probably something that people here can take away with them, is 
around the quality of data that you have. So if you're making assumptions, you're asking questions, yes, you're, it's, it's relevant. But when we're talking about the customer journey, providing the right product, the right product information, the baseline is making sure we input the quality data in the first place. Exactly. Because yep. otherwise, yeah, what you see is what you get. You know, the yep. old adage, yeah, yep. you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out again. Exactly. So in your example, if I just say, buy me the best cushion, if I were to, to get that instruction from my, from my wife, I would go out and buy a cushion that she definitely would hate. Because I bought the best cushion from my point of view, not from her point of view. And I don't have enough data of what it is that we're going to use the cushion for, where it's going to be. Is it going to be in our home, in our boat, in our country house, or wherever? Like, add more details to it. So I've just got one more point on something that you made earlier. I know that it's flashing red, but I think we've got a few more minutes. So you talked about social commerce being, uh, sorry, you were talking about the teenage years, uh, social. And I'm wondering whether social is actually, or e-commerce in its teenage years is actually social commerce. But the problem that we've got is a friction that's created by the payment, which relates back to what you were talking about, having to have regulations in place. How do you see us overcoming some of those challenges? Because at the end of the day, all of us want to be able to buy stuff one click, no click, thumbprint, whatever it is. But as a, these guys as businesses want to restrict fraud as well. Yeah, so I think that, or I know, because I've been working with some of the regulatory institutes, if we may call them, uh, I know that they're struggling because they have been adding these, these boundaries or this safeguard for years in other situations that that been growing into a situation that needs to be regulated during a couple of years or even decades. And now we're talking about a year, but in reality we're talking about weeks. Because when, when we talk about innovation products right now, the progress that we see in these solutions differ from one week to another. When I look at how we interpret voice and what we can do with voice in connection with AI, what I looked at two weeks ago, I saw in one example, I looked at a, a phone service solution that actually make phone calls and have a conversation with customers. There was a slight delay of around 0.5 seconds before the person that was communicating with the AI got a response from the AI. That 0.5 seconds made it feel like this is nothing that we can use for real. Because people will feel that there's a slight strange hesitation. And when I look at the same service just a couple of days ago, they already fixed that delay. Meaning that the conversation is totally smooth now. And again, this is not just because of the training data of how we handle voice. This is the training data that all of us are now generating. When we use ChatGPT, we do thumbs up or thumbs down if the answer is, is right. If we tell ChatGPT to rephrase the answer, we are saying to the training model, this was not good enough. If we go to mid-journey and we get these four different alternative images, we always say this image is what I like. Or if I add a new question that is similar to the previous one, then the model itself knows that, OK, I did not do a good, good enough job. We're scoring the AI platforms all the time. And we've been doing this for years. We've been building knowledge about what is right and wrong for years using CAPTCHA, for example, where CAPTCHA, as you have seen, whenever you register or send messages online and so on, you have to tick, OK, where are the, the buses, or where are the, the red lights, and so on. That's a training, training of AI. I think that is a very good note to, to finish on. That Actually, we're, we've still got a little bit of control in there. We're actually trying to get better quality of insight out of AI by telling it where to look, how to look, et cetera. So, Carl, thank you very much for your time, and thank you thank all you. very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.